Coming Dave Vellante to the queue. How you doing, John? Good to see you, man. Uh, Good in, to be uh, back in San Francisco. Uh, it's tough without you, Dave. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard. I'm like, you're like uh, my wingman. <laughs> it could have been that long. How, so, how long have you guys been going? A couple hours here? Uh, we've started at uh, 7 o'clock. So we had Simon Crosby on. I was, was Simon. Well, first of all, I want to ask you did, you, did you did you have Wi-Fi on your flight? No. The, uh, damn. JetBlue. JetBlue. JetBlue Pioneer with the dish, but they got to get got to get the Wi-Fi. I agree. Man, did you have a middle Changed seat? the experience. No, I had a good aisle seat. Extra <laughs> leg room. Worked the whole way. <laughs> so I was Simon. Simon was great. He said that uh, Zen and uh, Citrix are the only vendors that have built a mega cloud. And obviously, I'm getting private messages on, on Twitter saying, he's wrong, he's wrong. Of course, the internet, when someone's wrong, they like to point it out. Uh, he pointed out, he said, VMware has not deployed a mega cloud ever. And mega cloud being defined as over 10,000 server deployment. Um, Simon well, talked about uh, new new devices. He's excited about new devices that connect into consumer electronics. He talked about security. He talked about a lot about the future environments. Great interview. Well, Zen is the dominant, you know, public cloud <laughs> hypervisor, right? I mean, that's he said. That's a fact. He I said mean. that without their hypervisor, open source based, Amazon would not exist. I would estimate what eighty percent of the public clouds use Zen. Is that right? Yeah, Amazon use it, and uh, all the public cloud service providers. I mean, VMware was not really compatible with that emerging business model. So what's the buzz here? All, all desktop all the time? Um, the buzz here is obviously the mega trends of ubiquitous IP networks is kind of an old story. Um, obviously the convergence of networks and compute and storage. Um, the, the move towards unified communications as highlighted by our analysis with, with Skype and Microsoft will be a big theme tomorrow. I don't want to steal the thunder. We have some ex scoops. I want to be courteous to uh, Citrus and not blow the scoops out there before they announce it. But to me, Dave, the number one thing that I'm seeing is the economic recovery is driving all kinds of innovation and uh, tech investment from, from uh, IT, on the IT side, but on the macro uh, internet side, Zynga went, Zynga's filed to go public. Uh, Karish Wisher broke a story that they're going to go public. LinkedIn, LinkedIn went public last week. Rocketing. I mean, $10 billion uh, valuation. Everybody's waiting for Facebook. So, I mean, there's a massive refreshing uh, of an attitude and also an IT spend perspective of, 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 of an economic recovery. Well, we've been talking about all year for the last you know 12 months, consumerization, cloud, and mobile. And I guess that's what Citrix is all about, right? I mean, they're in the heart of all that. It's like uh, our summer tour here, uh, the Cube, Sa Sapphire last week, same concept, cloud, so mobile, social. Um, we're hearing from the grapevine that there's going to be a lot of emphasis on the personal aspect of the end user experience with Citrix, where the social dynamics of the web and the person is going to be a big part of their announcements. Yeah, well, we're definitely seeing the uh, transition of, of the away from the PC era into the cloud era into the mobile era, and that's what Citrix is. There, that's their sweet spot, right? I mean, Citrix has been around forever, but they're really very well positioned for that those mega trends. So I'm really interested in uh, meeting some of the guests here. We got a good lineup coming tomorrow, and uh, what's today? Tuesday, tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday, right? Yeah, we're going to go till 10 o'clock right now. It's 8:30. We're going to crank it up. Um, we're bringing you all the analysis, all the news and the analysis. Not a lot of news breaking because I know there's going to be a lot of press releases tomorrow. But again, what I'm hearing is personal cloud. I'm hearing a lot about the uh, private cloud, hybrid cloud, and then obviously the public cloud where, where Citrix is at a sweet spot. And of course, desktop virtualization, right? I mean, that's the what, what a lot of what Citrix is about, even though it's still, you know, it still hasn't exploded onto the scene. I mean, Gartner was predicting 2012 to 2015, the years of desktop well, virtualization, it's, it I mean, feels like it's going to happen, here's but some, it's not there yet. Here's some stats on Citrix, Dave. 100 million people touch Citrix. Go to meeting, go to PC. Uh, 100 million people touch Citrix, and a lot of people have never heard of them. Uh, two of the top 10 apps on the Apple App Store are Citrix. Top five SaaS, services as, software as a service businesses in the world run on Citrix. So Citrix is not a small player. They are big, their presence, and so I'm expecting to see what they do around the, me the mega trend of desktop virtualization. Right, uh, well we're talking about a $2 billion company. Um, uh, again, desktop virtualization is a big theme. Uh, it's still relatively narrow. I mean, it's confined to certain industries like financial services and government and healthcare and relatively narrow use cases, but the promise of thin client is 
simpler i t simplification of the experience on all devices not just your desktop but in your mobile devices as well and that's really what we're looking for having said all that there's only about fifty customers with over ten thousand licenses now that's a not a bad number but it's not an overwhelming number either so fifty customers with over ten thousand citrix licenses starting to reach critical mass but it's early days john you know dave it's early days and i asked one of the uh, citrix uh, employees about where we are in the in the readiness of their customers he said five or six i'm like i'd give it more like a two or a three at best i think the virtualization trend has changed the landscape of technology obviously just in the past three years vmware has completely remorphed their business obviously they're now owned by emc you're seeing uh, Citrix buy Zen. You're seeing them go to own the public cloud. You're seeing a massive surge in OpenStack around developers and open source communities, really trying to get a foothold in that business. So you're seeing OpenStack becoming a, an interesting dynamic. But to me, the big wild card is, will Citrix's desktop virtualization message hold through? Most people I talk to, they don't give a hoot about the desktop. All they care about is freedom, any device. So I, I hate the word desktop. I mean, we're not on desks anymore, we're on mobile. So I think SAP last week at Sapphire really nailed it when they really emphasized mobility. So I think Citrix might be hurting themselves a little bit by tying to this whole desktop metaphor. Now well, I know they sell to IT and they got to and they have a lot of Windows 7 clients and virtualization is nice there, but I question that. But question to you, Dave, what do you think about this desktop virtualization acronyms like VDI have been kicked around. It's a changing landscape. What's your opinion on that? Well, I think that the iPad changed everything. I, sit, I think Citrix knows that. I think Citrix's vision has to be applications delivered anywhere on any device, <laughs> anywhere in the world, globally, 24 by seven, securely. That's gotta be the vision. I'm looking to hear that. You know, desktop is really, really desktop is a, a, a metaphor for the OS, right? Um, whatever OS that is. Uh, and it should be anyway, whether it's Mac OS, whether it's iPhone, whether it's iPad or Windows. Here's the thing that I, the, what, I what I see about Citrix, about uh, opportunity, Dave, I see three things that they can really do well on. They have this kind of consumer play in the enterprise where people have used GoToMeeting, we've used it a few times, let's go to PC. The virtualization of the desktop creates that iPad app-like feel, mobility with Citrix receiver, et cetera. And then on the private cloud, they actually have a solution there with VDI, right? So you got the personal, kind of the, the, the user experience with GoToMeeting, and they got video stuff coming around the pike. Secondly, they got this private cloud messaging, which we heard at EMC heavily. And third, the public cloud. They, without Citrix, Amazon wouldn't exist. So to me, that taps into the developer community. And the developers are driving the entrepreneurial IT economy that we're talking about. This this uh, upswing in the, in the economy has been driven by the by the innovation around entrepreneurship and developers. So I, I think the the opportunity to get the developers to build the private cloud and to deliver an end user user experience to me is the triple threat for Citrix. They could if they can tie that together, the triple threat of user experience enterprise clouds, and then developers and innovation, they will win the day. I mean, I think that's a great message. If they can pull it off, I'm, I'm skeptical on some areas, uh, but I'm going to be watching that. Well, I mean, again, the three big things I'm watching are consumerization, cloud, and mobile. You've been talking about the consumerization of IT for a while. SiliconANGLE's been writing about that. Um, cloud, obviously, big mega trend in mobile. And Citrix is positioning for all three of those trends. Um, Again, I think it's very narrow right now. You know what? You know what a big barrier to uh, desktop virtualization is? Storage. I saw you just had Styotech on, <laughs> right? I mean, they were great. Is always a problem, right? So, so the thing is that a lot of people don't understand that desktop virtualization and server virtualization are the only thing they share is the name virtualization. They're two different things. So you get VMware coming and saying, "Oh well, we do server virtualization, so you should buy." View by desktop virtualization or VDI from us. And it's just, it's not necessarily the case, right? It's apples and oranges. So storage, again, is a big barrier. The, st the storage players really have to solve this problem. There's performance issues, there's workload issues. You've got to size this stuff. It's boring, but it's really important, John. You know, I think 
It's going to come down, you know, Dave, we talk about sizzle and the steak. We have to hear the announcements tomorrow to get into the sizzle and steak. But clearly the sizzle is cloud. The stake here is that they actually have virtualization technology in the public cloud. So my question that I want to ask Citrix people is, look at, okay, I buy the public cloud. Can you get to the enterprises? Can you su successfully get in through the top of the stack, the iPad? Can you get the virtualization to desktop? If they can penetrate that layer, they can win it. Now, I want to hear that. I have not seen that yet. Well, they have to, right? I mean, in fact, I, th I think the entire industry has to, uh, and the uh, iPad changed everything, <coughs> and that, that is the end game now, is any device, all apps, anywhere, and I would certainly expect to hear that from Citrix. I'll be shocked if we don't I hear mean, that from Citrix. Simon Crosby was on, he was phenomenal, but you know, Simon Crosby did, talked about- Did he talk about that issue? I mean, Well, his big thing was obviously harping on um, um, VMware against them, and he doesn't He likes to hammer VMware? Well, he said VMware's not a competitor because they don't launch, they don't deploy mega clouds. And he made a point. He said, innovation is the key to success. And cloud innovation right now is we're in the early stages. And he said, quote, without the public cloud, without Amazon, which they enabled to create, without the public cloud, Groupon would not exist. Without the public cloud, Zynga would not exist. So you cannot deny those, those milestones. The public cloud has enabled. So the question is, what, does, what happens on the enterprise? Do you buy that, that VMware's not a competitor of Citrix? I mean, no, I don't buy that at all. They totally compete. Right, I mean, VMware's at war with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, VMware announced, we covered VMworld, so we saw the transformation of VMware from being a enterprise-focused company with license problems, business model issues, to a completely refocused under Paul Moritz operating environment. We called it the Wintel with EMC and VMware. Absolutely legitimate in my mind. Well, I think those two guys are doing a great I'll job. I'll tell you my opinion on what makes VMware a, a real competitor is Spring. And I think VMware is um, really going after that developer base with Spring. The roots of, micro, uh, of Citrix are in Microsoft. Right? And I think Citrix has to, you know, obviously knows this, it's got to rapidly move off that, or, or expand that base to include other operating environments. And, and I think that VMware is very well positioned with Spring to do that. That's fundamentally VMware strategy, and Moritz is going hard after it, as we know. Uh, so I got, I got an update. We had a walk-on guest, Tom Trainer from Gluster, came He's on. Here? He's okay. here. Yeah, he was a guest on the Cube. He sat down, and we talked about um, HDFS, Hadoop's file system, and how he plays there. He was supporting it. He's Gluster is a very cool company. So, what's your angle on those guys? Well, I mean, you know, Floyer feels like that whole business is about to explode, and and uh, you know, they've got to get traction right now. They've got some nice whiz bang technology, but as we've seen so many times, it's just technology in and of itself doesn't really matter. They got to get people to start writing to their platform and really commercializing the technology. But, you know, uh, uh, Clustrix, Gluster, the, these new emerging file systems, I mean, you know, the flip side of that is, does the world really need another file system? And the flip side of that is, yeah, one that, you know, really is cloud ready. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com and SiliconAngle.tv. We are the worldwide leader in emerging tech coverage. You can find out what's going on on SiliconAngle.com. We are the reference point for emerging tech. SiliconAngle.tv is where we put all our video. This is theCUBE, our flagship product. And my co-host Dave Vellante is here with me. Yeah, Dave. I'm Dave Vellante from Wikibon.org. Check us out. Uh, check out the coverage, that, John, the coverage from Sapphire and EMC World is still exploding onto the site. I'm still seeing the team put up highlights of videos, blog posts. We did a, a Sapphire wrap up today on the wiki. We pumped out 31 blog posts, uh, three full days of video, hours and hours of video, and then uh, research, you guys, how much research you pumped out, tons of research. Uh, can't even count it, and, and we'll be doing the same thing here at Citrix. We'll be, at, we'll be at HP Discover, we'll be at the Dell Storage Forum, look for us there. It's the summer tour, the Cube. The Cube is on the Summer Tour 2011. We're going to go to all the events where tech matters. We go there, we cover it like a blanket. We are the worldwide leader in tech sports. And so, you know, people, I was saying that last time, Dave, that tech to me is like sports. You know, there's a game going on, and the executives and the, the people behind it are athletes. And the people who do all this IT stuff are truly, in my mind, tech athletes. Because if you think about the transformation we're seeing for the first time, and before you came on, I talked about the, the mega trends that we're seeing, um, the deployment of ubiquitous IP networks, the expansion of network-based consumer electronics, the move towards unified communications, 
the announce the the adva advancements of highly scalable low cost computing power in the cloud the convergence of network storage and compute, and finally an economic recovery we haven't seen in over a decade is causing a massive innovation cycle. And it's, it's really exciting, and there are a ton of people creating new companies, jobs are changing, and uh, it's innovation, and it's totally cool. Well, it's, fu it's funny, like I said, Citrix has been around for a long time, but a lot of the trends, the cloud, the consumerization, the mobile, uh, and the ubiquity of networks, I mean, Citrix's fundamental assumption is that there's going to be a network available um, even though they're doing some things for untethered folks as well. Um, but you know, generally, these trends are favoring Citrix and really coming into the sweet spot. So again, I I'm interested in learning more. It's a very competitive space. It's early days. Citrix has some advantages, um, but it's got to have a lot of competition. It's dancing the dance with Microsoft, right? Microsoft sort of controls the game board on this with, uh, with licensing. But Windows 7 looks to be, you know, very popular uh, with the early reviews in, and um, I think there's, you know, a lot of things there that are going to be favorable to Citrix. But it's got to play play nice with Microsoft, and it's done a very good job of doing that. And then you've got VMware, but VMware's, you know, desktop virtualization VDI strategy thus far has been a do-over, uh, maybe a twice do-over. So um, right now, Citrix is the dominant player, and. Um, is growing very nicely. Its business is up. It's going to do over two billion dollars this year. It's got uh, it's got a, a ton of cash on the balance sheet, over 1.5 billion on the balance sheet. So, I think it's in good shape. Dave, does cloud storage represent a threat to uh, NAS storage, or not, or can they coexist? I think cloud is another tier of storage, um, and, and I think that uh, I think in general it's a threat more to the traditional storage models, be they NAS or block. So I would say that the short answer is yes, cloud is a threat to any traditional storage model. The key to the cloud, in my opinion, is software. Being able to move on a policy basis the right data to the right target, whether that's a device, whether that's the cloud, whether that's a dedupe target, whatever it is, software is the key. Now, and that's why you see companies like EMC and also NetApp and others investing so much into software. What do you think about the, uh, we talked about a Sapphire SAP's event last week. What do you think about the tablet's impact to Citrix's business? You mentioned it when you came on earlier. The tablet has been the tech jewelry for business executives. I mean, on the consumer side, obviously it's selling out like hotcakes. Um, the iPhone, obviously game changing since 2007. Um, so that's the mobility smartphone craze, but the tablet brings the virtualization desktop equation into play. What do you think of the iPad as a, a disruptive enabler or a pleasant enabler? John, I think the CIOs look at it as a real opportunity and as you call it, a pleasant enabler. CIOs want to build a secure environment for their applications to run on any device, of a consumer device, a uh, professional device, a desktop, a laptop, even even an individual's device, my, my own, you know, my an employee's cell phone, for example, or smartphone. So they want to enable a secure environment. It's the app store model that I think we're going to see. We we saw glimpses of that last week at Sapphire. Again, it's early days, but I think this is going to move very fast. Do you think there'll be an Apple app store for the enterprise or a version of it that won't be Apple? I think very clearly. We saw last week SAP's strategy is to be the platform provider for the enterprise app store. I think you know once Oracle's going to copy that playbook, I think IBM will be looking at that seriously. But right now, I have to say, John, I was impressed with what I saw with SAP. They've got the technologies, they, they've got the vision, they've got the focus, and um, I think they've got an early lead there. Now, whether or not they can transition their legacy base, or, in fact, I think you're going to see the, the Apple iTunes app store you know, host a lot of these applications for small and mid-sized businesses. What's interesting to me is I think Citrix could make a run at Microsoft. So, you know, if you look at, if you think about what they're doing, the 100 million people touch Citrix. Um, they support over a billion devices with, with Citrix Receiver, uh, a product that has grown significantly for them, been a big part of their edge, edge uh, solutions. Um, they support 149 smartphones and 37 different tablets. Citrix has been a pioneer on the desktop for 10 years. The question is, are they over-educated? Are they ahead of the puck? 
are they there in the right spot? And what do you think of that? I mean, obviously they have the legacy knowledge and, and with all this massive change happening right now in this theater, do you think Citrix has too much baggage or are they positioned properly for capturing this transformation in the industry? Well, I think Citrix you know, largely has flown under the radar and has gotten a, a critical mass as a result of that. I mean, regarding Microsoft, Microsoft obviously has some huge advantages, not the least of which is its massive install base and its ability to play games with licensing. I mean, if Microsoft wanted desktop virtualization to take off, it could flick a licensing switch and everybody would be doing desktop virtualization. <laughs> and Azure, Microsoft's you know, development platform in the cloud, I think is also you know, a big investment that Microsoft's making appealing to developers, and I, that's, a, that's a big roadblock for Citrix to overcome. So I think Citrix has to play nice with Microsoft. It's doing a good job of that. Um, I, you know, Brian Madden wrote an article recently that uh, he called Citrix hotel art, you know, not meant to offend, right? And Citrix <laughs> does a good job of not offending Microsoft. <laughs> I think they might, they might have to at some point. Okay, so the next question I have for you, Dave, is obviously Citrix, very sexy messaging around, Having things on a laptop, I mean a note, I mean an, I mean an iPad and a mobile phone. Um, I love that message. Get my applications anywhere. My work stuff seems to all my problems go away. The reality is, in the enterprise with all this consumerization going on, there are some people who own that. Cisco, HP, people at the networking layer, people who own the networks, own the converged networkings. Um, they're kind of at the top of the stack. So the question is, how well can they play? in the trenches of some of these hardened, you know, and technologies where Moore's Law has kind of kicked in. Well, you mentioned Cisco, you mentioned HP. I mean, those are big partners of Citrix, right? At least for now, and, and good partners of Citrix. And uh, so they're working together. You know, I think the key is Citrix has to get desktop virtualization mainstream, and it's not mainstream today. Why is it not mainstream? It's just not appropriate for a lot of use cases, a lot of industries, and a lot of applications. The economics aren't necessarily there. The promise is there, and it's great in certain narrow, what I'll call narrow use cases and industries. I mentioned financial services, healthcare, government, education. Those are the guys that are taking up desktop virtualization and really glomming onto it. And you're starting to see larger installations, but again, still, you're talking about 50 installations worldwide of 10,000 licenses or more. You know, it's not ubiquitous yet. And the, the challenge for Citrix is to make that go mainstream. And again, storage is one of the big barriers. Storage for, for, for desktop virtualization is a major bummer right now. So, and what's the answer for that? I mean, obviously storage is a bottleneck. We had Xyotech on, they're talking about the, you know, they had 7.5 terabytes in that little casing. We showed it to the camera, they popped up like 400 people started watching, and you know, a little gadget porn there for the, uh, tech geeks out there, but what is the main bottleneck in storage? Why why isn't it advancing fast enough? I mean, Fusion IO, which we've been covering, you've been doing deep analysis on, it's going public, obviously they make solid state memory, uh, solid state drives. Um, what's your angle on the storage impact Here's to the this? issue. Um, with, the, with the billion PCs out there, however many it is, all those devices, think about the way in which we as individuals use storage. We're constantly pulling up files, we're writing files, there's a lot of IO activity. It's our own little storage farm, but it's distributed. So there's no real choke point on my little mini network there. When you all of a sudden start to centralize that and you do a VDI implementation or a desktop you know, virtualization, it becomes an IO blender, John. So the, the, the workload patterns for desktop virtualization are completely different, for example, than server virtualization. So as we all know, s server virtualization broke storage, and, and the, s the solution to server virtualization is not the solution for desktop virtualization. So you need to tune storage and design storage and architect storage specifically for desktop virtualization. And I presume that's what Xyotech was talking about. You got to size the workload, you got to understand the read write pattern. A lot of write activity in desktop virtualization versus server virtualization. So two different worlds. And I think the storage world, frankly, has not done a great job of architecting storage for uh, VDI and desktop virtualization. I know, and one of the things I know that Xyotech is doing is stripping out a lot of the complexity, really making it, making it very hardware focused and making it simple, dumbed down, DAS-like storage, super fast, really allowing the applications to do, it, do their job. So I think it's really a, a, a new way of thinking is required. 
And then you mentioned Fusion I.O. I think Flash plays a big part of this, especially when you have boot storms, right? When everybody comes in the morning at 9 o'clock, logs on an email, or everybody comes back from lunch, it's not a problem with an individual desktop. It's a huge problem when you have 1,000 clients or 10,000 clients banging away on an email system. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com, the worldwide leader in emerging tech innovation. And I'm and Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, the open source research advisory firm. This is theCUBE, our flagship teleclass, where we go to events, explore the, the smart nodes, all the smartest leaders and executives and thought leaders, customers, extract that signal from the noise and bring it and share it to you. Sharing is power, and we are on our summer tour 2011 where we go to all the events. Two weeks ago we were at EMC World in Las Vegas. Last week we were in Orlando, Florida for SAP Sapphire, and for this week we are live in San Francisco, California at Moscone West with Citrix Synergy. Dave, what is the theme from EMC World and Sapphire that you see here so far? I mean, you just got off the plane, but you know, we talked um, before you got here, kind of kind of has sense of it, but take us through the past two weeks. We were at EMC World in Las Vegas. Obviously, big storage vendor transforming their business and growing like crazy. Uh, SAP Sapphire last week. What's your kind of voodoo? What do you think is happening here? So at EMC World, of course, it was all about cloud meets big data. And, and the cloud is the one theme that we've seen from EMC World to Sapphire and now at Synergy. Um, the big data theme at EMC World, EMC basically uh, announcing it's doing its own Hadoop distribution, elbowing its way into the open source community, having a data scientist summit, announcing things like you know a, a vision toward data scientist training, really doing some great marketing there, but really cloud, VMware, private cloud going to hybrid cloud, and increasingly VM VMware, licking its chops, John, Simon Crosby would love this, on the public cloud. And then at Sapphire we heard, I think, a much more mainstream message around mobile, mobile computing. We did not hear that at, at EMC World, and not surprisingly, but I think increasingly EMC has to start thinking about you know, that trend, and we heard it loud and clear. At, at Sapphire it was really two main things, mobile applications and the whole new application app store for the enterprise, and HANA, in-memory computing. Not necessarily big data, but fast data. So certainly there's a lot of big data, however you define that, but fast data is really what SAP's message is about, doing things in real time or near real time. And here, we're seeing the confluence of consumerization of IT, cloud, and mobile, which brings the simplification theme, which we saw at all three events, uh, and a very strong mobile theme, which we saw at Sapphire, um, and uh, of course, cloud. Obviously, mobile is a big theme at SAP. Here they're using the word desktop. I mean, they keep on talking about desktop. You know, I guess that's the art that won't offend, as Brian Madden would say, but the bottom line is, you know, the, phys the notion of a physical desktop is old and it's dying. And the idea of, of a desktop, to me, conjures up this image of like, an IT worker sitting at their, worker sitting at their desk chained to a big, fat, bloated PC. And I look at Apple, I see Sleek, I see Mobile, I see Soccer Mom doing her work, and you know, father at his son's game. I mean, this is, this is what we do, I and mean, people are mobile. And we want that real-time experience. So to me, I wonder how they're going to get desktop virtualization to the mainstream. As, uh, and the second uh, question I'm looking at, Dave, and this is where I want to get your opinion is, you know, they're talking about being a fabric. Everyone wants to have a fabric. We're going to be the, the network fabric that ties it together. That's hard stuff to do, and, this, and the question is, can they do it and provide the solutions? So, you know, we are in an era of consultancies, as we talk about services angle. What roadmaps are they providing their customers? What proof points? What reference architectures? How do they accelerate the success of their, of their customer base? To me, that's what I want to know. Well, the, yeah, I think you're right about desktop. The marketing thus far around desktop has been big D, little d, little d implying mobile, but it doesn't do it for me, John, I'm sorry. The desktop term is just outdated. Everybody talks about we're moving beyond the PC era. Well, let's move beyond the PC era. John, you, let's, let's, Get let's agree to coin a new term this week. Okay. Yeah. Let's, we we'll come up with it. We uh, coined fast data last time. But no, but seriously, the desktop's okay. got to get, got to go. So it's so got to go, right. Now, on the second point you're making about fabric, everybody, as you're right, is talking about new fabric, right? Wants to be the fabric player, whether it's Cisco, Brocade, Juniper, uh, Citrix, obviously, big networking or growing networking business. Here's the thing. With the cloud, we're seeing a flattening of the network hierarchy. And 
maybe it is jump ball and networking. You know, we're seeing Cisco, we're seeing cracks in the Cisco armor, uh, but, but Cisco's aware of that, trying to get out, you know, from, from underneath that, get ahead of its skis as opposed to behind it right now. And so the flattening of the network, everybody wants that, is it jump ball? And then your last point about services, I think is a really good one. We saw last week at Sapphire, SAP, a company where services companies have lived off of complexity for decades, business process re-engineering, re uh, uh, ERP, enterprise resource planning, consultants like Accenture and CSC and IBM or PwC before them and many, many others, Fujitsu, et cetera, have lived off of that complexity of SAP. And we're seeing that transition to cloud, to mobile, to simplicity. That's a big opportunity for services company, but it's also very disruptive to them. And it also, it's combined with this whole new cloud service provider space. So we saw uh, Rackspace recently announce desktop virtualization solutions, right? Now that, you're seeing cloud service providers offer internet class services, highly disruptive for the traditional services company. So big opportunity, but big disruption going on. So the question is, how do they get provide cloud? What, okay, first of all, what is a cloud provider? We heard at VMworld on, Online service providers are now cloud providers. Um, is a cloud provider a startup? Is it an enterprise themselves? Is it a Verizon business? Is it Terramark? I mean, you know, what is a cloud service provider? One and two. If everyone's focused on the development side, if these stacks are not built out and they're still a moving train, how can you deploy consultantly services around it? Yeah, well, so I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the need for consulting and services remains. To me, John, the cloud provider is not is not the web hosting company. To me, the cloud provider is not the web hosting company, right? It's the, it's the new model of an elastic compute model that, that Amazon really popularized in the early 2000s or mid 2000s. A lot of companies doing, putting lipstick on a pig saying, oh yeah, we're cloud too. And it's really web hosting. Okay, you can have package number one or package number two and package number three. Well, I just want more compute. Well, sorry, that's package number three. That's not cloud to me. So cloud is about on-demand, elasticity, being able to turn the knob, dial up or dial down whatever resource I want with a great deal of granularity. Not necessarily infinite granularity, but with a great deal of granularity. That's what I consider true cloud service providers. I do think the consulting opportunity is how do I change my business, not just my IT organization, but my business to transition to the cloud? And that's where the consulting opportunities well, we exist. Heard, we heard last week uh, at Sapphire SAP show, agility was the number one reason people wanted to do cloud anything, mobile, software, and cloud. So, so agility, how does Citrix play into this Citrix equation, I mean, of agility? They're, uh, Virtualization company. Well, I think a lot of the marketing is a bit ahead of the, the reality because when you talk to CIOs, they're still looking at cloud as a way to save big bucks. And as we heard from, from Siki Junta last week, who's a, a very articulate uh, uh, practitioner from uh, CSC, you could save 30 to 40% by deploying in the cloud if you deploy the right applications and you do, do some planning. So I think we're still in the cost cutting efficiency mode and, and, and visionaries want, uh, want to talk about the agility piece. Now very clearly, that's the case for a lot of the, the web startups. But for a lot of the traditional businesses, we're still taking cost out of the equation, and agility is you know, a close second, and I think ultimately it's going to flip the equation. It has to flip the equation. We can't just keep justifying things based on cutting costs. There's going to be nothing left to, left to cut. So I do think the marketing is right, it's just that the, the, the market has to catch up to the marketing. What do you think of Citrix as compared to VMware? I mean, obviously we're at Citrix Synergy. Uh, again, it's only our first night to kick off. People are really partying, kind of hanging out, going to, doing the booth, checking out the booths. But I mean, relative to VMware, how would you rank Citrix against everybody else too? I mean, the, relative to all the market forces. Are they well positioned? Are they like uh, throwing the Hail Marys? I think they are two different companies. I mean, they are definitely competitive and they're competitive because, because VMware covets what Citrix has, which is that really strong base of de desktop virtualization. That's really where Citrix shines and VMware doesn't. VMware is on, I don't know, at least it's second or third, you know, as they called it before, a do-over of, of VDI. And it's really trying to find the right formula. It's turning knobs. It's 
very Microsoft-like, John. We're at the version 1.0, oh, that didn't work. Let's do a version 2.0, oh, that didn't quite work. 3.0 is going to be really good. Citrix there is there. I think Citrix is the gold standard for desktop virtualization. They've been doing it for 10 years, so these guys have been around. But the question is, I wonder if, if they have too much baggage. 10 years doing one thing, they're in essence an, inc an incumbent in this area. Can they truly change and be nimble enough as a company to really do well and be innovative? Can they truly be innovative? Can they do the open source stuff, still make money? Can they get the developers on board? And can they deliver the solutions fast enough? To me, that's the fundamental question with Citrix. I think they're well positioned. I think that the triple threat around Citrix is real. I think the opportunity of the triple threat of personal, you know, social web, private cloud, and public cloud is all real. And if I was, if I was uh, in working in the marketing department at Citrix, I would get rid of desktop, get rid of that term, tell Microsoft, forget about it, we're getting rid of the term, we're going to call it mobile. Just call it mobile. Because that's what people want. They want mobility. As a consumer in the IT environment, I want to have true mobility. I want access to my apps. That is not about a desktop. That's more about being on the run. That's well, about real-time web. And I got to tell you, SAP nailed it last week. Their messaging was so rock solid. I was solely impressed with them. They talked about mobile. They even downplayed big data, which is the big, tr big hype horse to ride these days. So I mean, they talked about big data, but it wasn't really the central theme. What you coined as fast data, they, that's not their term, that should be their term, that was your term, but that was a very perceptive on your part, and it really was what SAP was talking about. You know, as far as Citrix goes, I think it can, John. Uh, you know, yes, maybe it's because it's got a legacy base, but, but really, the legacy base is really around, you know, access, right? And that's what desktop virtualization or mobile virtualization, whatever we're calling it, is all about its access from to, to applications from anywhere. And they've, they've done a good job of that. It reminds me, John, of the Cognoses and the SASs of the world. You remember it used to be called decision support systems. It was really boring, kind of slow growth, no growth market. And then all of a sudden it exploded. And now, you know, you, you had a run on companies like Cognos and you had a lot of acquisitions, but, but um, we got a comment. Uh, I got I got a private message on uh, Crosby, Simon Crosby's comment about, um, um, hey, Zen is the only mega cloud solution deployed. Any 10K deployments on VMware out there? I got a, uh, a message from someone said, based upon what Joe Tucci presented at the analyst briefing where I was at in London, um, he said, Mosey is bigger than EC2 and other petabyte scale clients wouldn't be there without VMware. So to Crosby's point, there's proof points on the EMC side, that's or a VMware side, EMC side, that Mosey is bigger than EC2. You know, this is an interesting or discussion. Or I should say S3. This is an interesting discussion, In particular. John. Here's the thing, I, I'll make an observation. VMware thus far has really been about the private cloud. Server virtualization within the four walls of companies or within the virtual walls of companies, right? Um, and, 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 and Zen and Citrix have been providers of the public cloud. When you think of the public cloud, I think of really a single application, Facebook, serving you know, yeah. hundreds of millions of users. When I think of the private cloud, VMware's business, I think of hundreds or thousands of applications servicing thousands or 10,000s of users. Really two different ball games. So VMware's challenge is, all right, how do I take that discipline of virtualization in the in the in the enterprise, that private cloud, and make it hybrid or make it public at public scale. VMware really has to prove that it can do that. And you know, maybe there are a few proof points out there. I don't consider Mosey one of them. I mean, Mosey is a, a basically a company that does, you know, desktop backup. Um, you know, nice company, nice products, but and, and and tons of storage, right? More than EC, more than S3, as we heard. But I think we're talking apples and oranges there when we talk about sc the scale that Simon Crosby's talking about. I want to see VMware stand up and say, yes, we've got deployments as large, at scale, hybrid cloud, public cloud, oh. virtualized right, here, desktops. Here's the, here's the million doll billion dollar question for you. In the light of the PlayStation hack costing the company billions of dollars, RSA got hacked, Amazon crashed, all kinds of weird you know what's happening on the web. 
Security is a huge issue. Pat Gelsinger at EMC said security is a do-over. I asked Simon Crosby the same question, and he said security is a do-over. He said the old security paradigms of chasing the bad guys are is over, and that McAfee semantic, they're toast. So the, you know, the question that needs to be discussed is, if these people are going to be moving their business over to vet desktop virtualization, what the, what the hell is going to happen on the security side? What is the security model? We talked about this at Sapphire. Any any changes in your views on security? Yeah, I mean, the, historically, security has been achieved by building a fence around physical resources. So I know that adapter A goes to controller B, goes to storage device C, goes to server D, whatever it is. I know that path, and I can secure and harden each of those resources. So think of the queen. The queen's in a castle. You dig a moat around the castle to protect the queen. Along comes virtualization, and the queen wants to leave her castle. <laughs> so when the queen leaves her castle, you don't know where she's going. You need a lot of virtual machines that go you with her. You can't just put a, a brick wall around the queen, okay? And so it's very hard. Fundamentally, security practitioners that we talk to in the Wikibon community don't know how to solve that in the middle problem, we call it. They, you know, the edge, okay, fine, you can, you can do the endpoints, but it's all that stuff in the middle with multi-tenancy that is really, really tricky. What do you think about the, uh, the investment in IT, Dave? I mean, obviously, we're talking about an IT recovery. We're talking about an, a, an economic boom, okay? We're seeing an economic upswing that is fueling innovation, entrepreneurship, IT refreshes. I mean, IT has been a dead, horrible landscape over the past 10 years. Now, all of a sudden, boom. Massive change, server virtualization, desktop virtualization, really fast networks, application development, very rapid, things like OpenStack that they're promoting here. I mean, it's a developer's dream. I can, I can deploy in the cloud what I couldn't do five years ago. And this is, this is what's driving the entrepreneurship. How is this IT economy changing? And what does that mean for CIOs? I mean, you know, you ran, you used to run a CIO consultancy. What is your view on that? I mean, do you have an opinion? I do. I, I actually think that's a very interesting comment that you just made, that for the last 10 years, IP, IT has been a dead industry. And, and I was going to debate that, but I want to I wanna make an observation. Y2K was the peak, right? I mean, that was like the boondoggle. And then, obviously, we saw a dip after Y2K. And the market came back, but to your point, the market came back largely around things like compliance. You know, Enron blew up, right? You had a lot of reporting. And, and you're right, there hasn't been a lot of innovation. The IPO market has been very stagnant. Along comes Web 2.0, along comes big data, along comes cloud, and you're seeing this massive innovation. A lot of people are calling it a bubble. The difference is this time around, you're seeing real profits. And you're seeing the, the companies that, that made it through the dot-com bubble are wildly profitable, companies like Google, for example, and, and frankly, even the you know the Ebays of the world have a very viable business, even though they're going through some transitions. So we're seeing massive disruptions, tremendous opportunity, new entrants like EMC of all people, which is just shocking to me, and then all these public cloud guys. John, the the public cloud versus the so-called private cloud guys. There's like two different industries. One is, you know, really based on a lot of legacy apps and legacy infrastructure, and the other one is exploding. It's like the old PC days. And I'm not so sure those two industries are going to com come together anytime soon. I think all the innovation is happening in the, in the consumer side, in the public cloud side. I mean, I think, I mean, first of all, my observation on that, first of all, great conversation here. A lot of things, that, the observations that I see, Dave, happening right now is that there are two forces that really didn't exist in the web 1.0 world, or the search world, or the bubble world, or even in IT. And that is people and data. They existed, the, peep, the person, the, the people and data existed, but it was a passive relationship to technology. People have, were users. You're a user, I mean, hell, I'm a heroin user, what? You know, user was a term, quite frankly, is a bad term. They used something, so they were, Passively involved, and there was a mono, you know, mono direction, you know, mono, uh, you know, monologue between the, the, the computer and the user, um, and then data was stored, owned by the enterprise, and we didn't really have a mobile environment. Everything was done, you know, in person. But now, with the web and the way it's architected now, the 
the people and the data are now integral parts of the technology, the computing, and the data. So those two forces alone change the game on collaboration, they change the game on mobility. Now the user, the user, the consumer, has a part of it. So I think the term user is dead. I mean, I've always been, a neg been negative on the word user. We have users, we have consumers. So you know, the consumer is active, the consumer is contributing, whether it's open source on the developer side or providing data on the mobility side, downloading apps, and then the data is much more strategic fast data, integrating into the applications, real-time analytics. Those two forces are changing the business and we haven't seen that before. So I'm really excited about that, Dave. Those are two, two things. And, and we're, we're, I was saying earlier, we're in an, a user experience computing market. The user experience is at the center of it all. The data, the people, the relationships. So I think that's the common theme that I'm seeing come from Sapphire in particular and this show. Well, we talk about data a lot. We use data in our business. We've got, you know, what we would consider, I guess, data scientists, right, on staff, doing some interesting things. I mean, it really is becoming a, a data and information driven wave. Um, but I got a question for you, John. I, I want to speculate a little bit about Citrix. Who's going to buy Citrix? Why doesn't Microsoft just take Citrix out? <laughs> 20 billion gets it done. What do you think? I don't Too know. Too rich? Hold on, let me check. Let me check my data dashboard here. I have a list of acquisition targets for Citrix. Um, so I, I think Citrix, oh, we got a little, I got some data coming in off my Skype client. Um, IBM brought Watson here and they're playing against him. They're looking for challengers. What, Jeopardy or chess? Jeopardy? <laughs> Tech Jeopardy? It's too, bad. I, it's too bad it's not chess. We could get David Floyer up here. David Floyer a, was a a teenage European um, grand champion, uh, you know, junior champion. Yes, very, uh, very uh, accomplished chess player. I don't think he could beat Deep Blue though. If Gary Kasparov couldn't do it, but, um, so I don't know. I mean, seems to me, John, twenty billion gets it done, right? They're fifteen billion dollar market cap. $2 billion company, so trading at seven and a half times revenue. It's a little rich, but why not? Great asset. Microsoft needs mobile. Okay, I'm checking. Uh, I mean, it's a very unique company. Right? It's not like there's a ton of these guys out there. Right? I mean. Hold on. I'm, just, I'm going to just double check my can little. Can Citrix stay independent? Can it yeah, stay I acquisition proof? And, and how? How does it do that? You asked me uh, at SAP Sapphire if, um, who was it would be bought? No, was it EMC? You asked me if uh, NetApp would be bought. Yeah, we were talking and about I, And NetApp. I said no, and then I started thinking, NetApp, NetApp and Citrix have a low enough market cap where I could see them getting swallowed up in a mega merger. Don't you, see, don't you think we're going to start seeing mega deals like that? I think you're going to see the, remember back in the 80s, the junk bond craze and you know, companies were merging KKR. together. KKR. KKR, I mean. Which, by the way, Marius Haas just went to KKR. Yeah, I mean, he's a corp. Yeah, he did the big corp, uh, the, Cisco, uh, the, the compact deal. To, uh, my private equity. My prediction is we are going to see a massive M&A market. Billions and billions of dollars. Not a billion dollars here or eight billion dollars there. 20 to 40 billion dollar acquisitions coming down, consolidating these big monsters together. Microsoft, Citrix could be a possible one. Cisco EMC. Cisco EMC, NetApp, Net Citrix, Cisco. NetApp Oracle. I mean, you know. NetApp Oracle. I think NetApp's in play. I mean, I don't know. a lot of market forces are there, but again. We love to speculate on these This scares me because with the uh, LinkedIn IPO, that would totally be very Enron-ish. Microsoft and Facebook? The, scare the hell out of How about that, Microsoft well, look and Facebook? At, uh, look, look at, let's not, let's Let, not. Is that out of the question? I wouldn't look at that out of the question. I could see Facebook buying Microsoft um, soon. I didn't say who so, was going to buy who. So, or merging. Now, Bing, the Bing search engine, integrated Facebook in a very deep way. If you look at the new refresh. Bing is making traction. If you look at the Bing refresh, which just happened last week, go to bing.com and check out the search results, you'll see a it's very nice. deep integration to Microsoft. I mean, to Facebook. With Facebook. So, you know, that's one sign. So what I would do if I was Microsoft is I'd go roll up the drop boxes of the world, get into this market. They got Skype. 
I would say Dropbox is a very big acquisition target right now. We've been hearing about them, especially with the iPad implement uh, use case. You don't need thumb drives anymore. I use Dropbox on the cloud. Dropbox is a very interesting proposition. Great. Box, great. Box.net. Yeah, Box.net. Dropbox has a great freemium model, right? You get two gigabytes for free, and then you move up. Uh, uh, Dave Cahill on Wikibon just wrote an analysis, and the title of the piece was something to the effect of Carbonites, uh, the economics uh, of carbonite or lack thereof. Okay, basically what he's saying is that carbonite spends more money acquiring customers than it makes on those customers. So their three year life cycle, they lose money. Now maybe they have a long term customer retention model that, that's attractive, but Dropbox has a great model, much less because it's viral. So that freemium model is very effective. So I, a lot of people are talking about Dropbox. Great utility there. Box.net is another one that you mentioned. Growing like crazy. Whitney Tidmarsh, we had her on. She's great. Okay, we are here live in San Francisco, California at Citrix Synergy. Huge trade show. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com and SiliconAngle.tv. And I'm Dave Vellante, Wikibon.org. And we're here at Citrix Synergy, the worldwide leader, SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle TV, the worldwide leader in tech coverage. Citrix Synergy is ground zero right now for a massive trend that everyone's talking about, virtualization, desktop virtualization. Not a lot of people know how successful Citrix has been. They have a couple products that people use every day. Citrix, go to meeting, go to PC for virtualization. They've touched 100 million users. Um, just some stats on, they have, they have stats on Citrix. 100 million people touch Citrix with their applications. Two of the top 10 apps on the Apple I, App Store is Citrix. Top five software as a service businesses run on Citrix. Citrix is one of those silent major players that power the virtualization market. Without Citrix, Amazon.com would not exist. And without Amazon.com, you wouldn't see things like Zynga, Groupon, Facebook. All these new technologies that are out there were enabled and innovated by Zen Virtualization, Zen Source. All, the key to all this has been open source virtualization and now Citrix in the desktop space for over 10 years. Granted, legacy is evolving and transforming, Dave, with virtualization. So again, without Citrix, there would be no Amazon.com. Hey John, just to add a little more color to that, we're talking about a $2 billion company with a $15 billion market cap and 1.6 billion in cash on the balance sheet. Throws off a lot of cash, got 23% operating margins, threw off $150 million in cash last, qu last quarter. It's a growing company, it's got a, a strong foothold in the market trying to make desktop virtualization go mainstream. I would totally stock up on this stock. The ticker symbol is uh, CTXS. I think they're undervalued at $15 billion. Just from a quote, trend, riding the trend wave, absolutely worth more than LinkedIn. Okay, so you know if you want a stock to buy, don't buy LinkedIn, buy Citrix. Yeah, what do you think of the LinkedIn IPO? I mean, totally overhyped. You know, uh, Henry Blodgett from uh, Business Insider called it absolute pump and dump yeah. by the bankers. People were calling me the day before saying, you got to get your hands on that LinkedIn IPO. I said, I, I wouldn't touch it. I mean, it's going to rock it up. The little guy gets screwed. He'll maybe make 10% on day one. And I just don't see it. I mean, well, okay, hold on. Let me, after I just scared them for the pump and dump scam, which they did, um, I will say that I'm bullish on LinkedIn. I mean, I like LinkedIn. They're a startup that's like six, seven years old. They grinded it out, got venture funding, they bulked up. They have really valuable user base. Absolutely. The data that they have is significant, and I'm bullish on their opportunity, but it is absolutely risky. I do not see them at a $10 billion company. I think there's a ton of risk. I think the management team is solid. I think the execution potential is there to be worth a very big company, but absolutely today, they are a very solid company, great management team, but the future value of what they're being valued on today is still risky, not worth the I mean, valuation. I, I, I love LinkedIn as a tool. I mean, and we're not, we don't pick stocks. John and I aren't stock analysts, but we love to speculate, don't we? But <laughs> what does that say to you that LinkedIn rocketed the way it did? What does it say to you? What's, it, what's the market telling well, you? Well, first of all, it's exciting from, I live in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto. Palo Alto's my playground. Entrepreneurships are there, VCs are there, entrepreneurs are there. 
It's great. It's a good. It's a good outcome to see liquidity. Yeah, the bankers did a little reach around on LinkedIn on there. I, I see that. But the the issue is, this is an opening of a market where there's liquidity, and I think that's great news for the economy. I think it points directly to what I see as the next big wave of liquidity. That's on the IT side. I think we're going to go through a massive renaissance of IT refresh. We're going to see massive money flow into the sector. The Citrix show here is going to create massive wealth creation for people who have jobs, entrepreneurs. So LinkedIn telegraphs to me that the tech business is back. People are experiencing firsthand the technology that to me was created by the internet and then solidified by Apple computer with the, the kind of consumer technology that wasn't kludgy. I hate to say it, it wasn't like Microsoft. Is, is LinkedIn worth $9 billion in no. your opinion? Yeah, so you I mentioned liquidity. I haven't done the discounted future cash flows yet, so, uh, but I can tell you right now, I would not buy that stock. Well, there. you mentioned liquidity. It's a, it's a small float on that stock, so there's, there's not a lot of shares outstanding, and there's, there are not a lot of options out there. How many you know, social networking companies can you buy okay. shares of well, on the I think, public I market? I think there's nothing else out there. What the, LinkedIn, what the LinkedIn IPO tells me, Dave, is that there is huge demand for tech stocks that are emerging. So it's an emerging beacon for me that says, hey, you know what? If LinkedIn can go public and go surge at that level, Fusion IO, Zynga announced today, Kara Swisher on all things deep, exclusive story she broke. Zynga's going public, um, that's the deal. Um, Zynga's growing like crazy. They are absolutely crushing it. Um, and then, you know, if you look at LinkedIn versus uh, Zynga, there's just no other new products in the market. So the, the average consumer who's buying stocks thinks, oh, LinkedIn, I use LinkedIn, that's an emerging technology, which really it isn't, but there's no other products out there. So Fusion IO, I expect that to be a massive IPO. If LinkedIn is, is, a, is an indicator of the market, um, certainly Fusion IO is gonna go right off the shelf well, and Fusion, go massively north. Fusion IO is powering those types of firms, right? I mean, it's pow powering these Web 2.0 companies, these social media firms. Groupon is gonna go public next. They're gonna line up, man, like airplanes. So once the IPO market opens up, I'm gonna see a massive tsunami of people start lining up. The investment bankers are gonna get rich. Entrepreneurs are going to get rich, and that's good. I think LinkedIn is good that these guys got wealthy. I think Reed Hoffman is a great entrepreneur, and I think you know that kind of success, getting you know the wealth creation, is what Silicon Valley and entrepreneurship is all about. I think that's a good thing, and you know the proof is in the pudding. They have a good story. They have a lot of data. They have to morph from a Rolodex networking tool to a data platform. What's different about this bubble, if we can call it that, from the last one? Talk about it. Um, I think the, the bubble here is about just the lack of real public companies in the market. So on the public side, I just say that, like I said before, just not, not enough product in the market. The difference on the private market where you have companies getting funded is, and I was just talking to Simon Crosby about this before we went on, was that they can get funded for half a million dollars or a million dollars or five million dollars, use cloud, use open source, and get to five, 10, 20 million dollar runway, Groupon, Zynga. And once you hit those valuations in terms of revenue growth, or even projected revenues, you're validated. So you can go right, you know, go right to a massive financing uh, where you don't have to sell a boatload of the company to investors. So that's a major trend. So those companies that are being valued have real revenue. So unlike the last bubble, there's real revenue behind it. The difference is there's no, sec there's no real public market to trade these stocks. So you're seeing a lot of bubble activity amongst the venture community to jockey for position for these big deals. And that's why you see the big names like Sequoia, uh, no, um, uh, NEA, XL, Benchmark, throwing huge valuations at these companies because they want to just get rid of the angel investors and take over the good deals. Because hey. that VC who has a $200 million fund, they're going out of business, basically. A couple other differences is, you know, the, the last bubble, it was, it was really VC money changing hands, wasn't it? You had dot-coms advertising with dot-coms and and buying infrastructure from the likes of NetApp and EMC and really running up, you know, just basically artificially, you know, meeting demand. Uh, and the other difference is you got way more users on the internet spending much more time. You got real consumers. So the advertising that's going on on the internet is, is real. Just pick up any magazine, you know, and look at how thin it is. I mean, other than Vogue, right? And, 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 and some of those other magazines, but look at the tech pubs. Tech pubs are like this. They're so well, thin Well, media now. is, Dave, media is dying. We heard from people that come on theCUBE. We're here at theCUBE at Synergy. You look around. 
You know, we're on the ground with a mobile HD studio, three cameras. We're changing media. We not, we're not CNBC. We're more like ESPN in 1980. Well, you heard what Sanjay Poonin said from SAP, president of SAP Go to Market. He said, this is the future of media. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we want to go in-depth conversations. Uh, we're broadcasting live from the ground floor at Citrix Synergy, the trade show for Citrix. This is SiliconAngle.com. I'm John Furrier. And I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and we're here. We are a number one worldwide leader in tech coverage. Citrix Synergy is in Moscone Center in San Francisco, California. And Dave, the energy here is high. We got a lot of activity going on, um, and this is just the kickoff. It's opening night. We're going to go in depth with interviews from all the top executives. We just had Simon Crosby on. We have a slew of others, and uh, we're going to come right back. Uh, I'll let you comment on uh, what your opinions are, real quick. Yeah. So. Um we're here at Moscone West, a lot smaller venue than uh, where VMworld is held at the, the main Moscone Center. Um, and so I think we're talking about a, a, a show of thousands here, 1,000, 1,200, maybe 1,500. And um, you know, I'm looking out here at the, uh, at the exhibit hall. Um, Wise obviously has a big presence here, right, as the, a thin client provider. Um, of course, Citrix is a is a is a big big presence. HP is a big partner of, of Citrix. Um, AppSense, Splunk, some of the new emerging companies that we see here. And, uh, <laughs> so, so it's quite a scene. Just getting started. We've got uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is the event. We'll be covering uh, tonight. We're going till 10:30 Pacific time. Uh, we'll be all day tomorrow, on Wednesday and Thursday. And um, we've got a great program for you this week. A lot of guests from Citrix. We've got some of the ecosystem coming by. Uh, we've got some service providers. We've got some startups. Should be fun, John. Yeah, I mean, uh, the silic siliconangle.com, Dave, is the reference point for emerging tech innovation. That's my site. We have a lot of bloggers over there. So for you, all the viewers out there, go to siliconangle.com and get... The, get informed on all the perspectives in tech innovation. We're the worldwide leader in tech innovation. SiliconANGLE TV is where we put all our videos. SiliconANGLE TV is a new video site where we're, we're like the ESPN of 1980. We're like the covering tech in depth 24 seven. And the Cube is our flagship product. We cover news at events, analysis and opinions. We bring interviews with thought leaders and bring them to you. We're excited to be here in San Francisco, California at the Moscone Center for Citrix Synergy and uh, Dave, you know, I got I to tell you, the, the interesting thing here is that the one of the themes that keeps coming up over and over again, and, and for the folks out there who don't understand the IT, enterprise, corporate, tech market, uh, it's changed over the past 10 years. But this year is the year of the consumerization of IT. What that basically means is you get to use your iPhone or Android phone anywhere and not have to worry about IT corporate policies. Because in the old world, you go to work, and you get chained to a desk, desk somewhere, they cut off Facebook, they cut off YouTube, you can't play games, you can't check sports scores, you're like totally like a, in jail, okay? You gotta use the company phone, you're sneaking in your iPad, that's all going away. You basically can go to work from any location, on any device, use any application, that's the preferred future. And these vendors like Citrix are trying to drive you there. So, so yeah. to me, that's a major, major step in the right direction. I, th I think the trend spotters saw this early on. You obviously been talking about consumerization of IT for a long time. My friend Dave Michella first mentioned the term to me in 2005, and we're now seeing CIOs really driving hard within their organizations. It's all about simplicity. You know, the IT industry is going to is changed forever. All that complexity in enterprise applications, it's got to go, John. I got a question that came over my, um, my Twitter direct message. It says, You're, you were ta talking about this bubble and how valuations are getting where they are. What about some people are saying about valuations being tied to the Fed interest rates and how are they effectively at zero and that's driving the valuations? Yeah, well, the, the answer there is money is easy right now. And easy money <laughs> means... People are going to raise money. They're going to increase their balance sheets. Google just did a financing, right? Did, did, did a bond, raised money. Um, and that, what does that mean? That means they're going to bulk up on their balance sheets. That means they're going to be able to acquire more companies. The price of those companies goes up, and that's what creates this frothy effect. So the effect of easy money is, uh, is it's a good question. There's no, no doubt that it's fueling 
some well, of I the mean, frothiness. Yeah, you know, for me, I mean, I really can't comment on the interest rates. I'm not an economist, but the bottom line is, you know, people follow the money, and money follows opportunity. And when there's, when the when the system gets tweaked by interest rates, which essentially is a big lever on how money's going to flow, it moves to investments. And some investments will be certain asset classes. Housing bubble crashed. Now, venture capital has been an asset class. Startups are an asset class. So basically, money follows opportunity. And so the bubble is all about racing. So what you see in the tech business is the me too investing. So what I get cautious of is the me too investing where you go in and you say, oh, I got to have a social network. I need a photo sharing application because someone else got it. When people start investing at that level, when you start to see Me Too, you know, a monoculture of like investments, you got to run for the hills, because the best investments are the ones that nobody sees. It's the ones that everyone hates. No one liked Facebook. No one liked Twitter. No one liked the best deals. It's so funny. So when you look at the investment cycle, you got to look at what conventional wisdom is doing, the herd, or you go with where the smart money is. So to me. The angels and the early stage investors to me in Silicon Valley are the smart money. The higher end firms become asset class managers and I think they're gonna try to control the big deals. We're here on the ground in San Francisco, California. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv. We're located in Palo Alto, California. We are on the ground at Citrix Synergy covering all the tech trends inside the